welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. So why don't we do this? Let's prepare our hearts. Let's go before the Lord. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. If you would, stand to your feet and let's honor the Lord as we go before him in prayer tonight. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're grateful that we get to be in this place. God, thank you for your presence, which is already here, Lord. God, thank you for your power and for the miraculous display of your strength as you healed people tonight, God. Lord, we look forward to hearing the good reports and testimonies that are going to come out of what you did in this place. And God, we don't want to stop there, Lord. We want to keep going with you, God. We want to go to greater depths of understanding and the wisdom and knowledge of God. So tonight, Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us and open us up to receive it, God. We thank you, Father God, that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand, Lord. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we wouldn't just ask this blessing on ourselves without also asking for it on behalf of our brothers and sisters, Lord, all those churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. We love them, Lord, and we honor them tonight, God. We pray that you would bless them and move in their lives as well as ours, God, and we give you the thanks and the praise for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, and we say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Grab your Bible and go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter number 28, verse number 18 and 19. I've entitled the message tonight, Go Therefore. We've been taught in this church that anytime you see the word therefore, that it's there for a reason. Because of what Jesus just said, now we're going to find out what the thing is there for. This morning we read some verses out of Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse number 18 and verse number 19. Very famous verses. You may know them as the great commission. And let's read it together. And it says, and Jesus came and spoke to them, being his disciples. And really, when we read something like this, that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, we know that his disciples have lived their life. And now the people that are the, the disciples here on the earth is you and I. And so when we read something like this, Jesus is speaking to them. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Really, God has contained this for thousands of years for you and I to take a look at and to take it personally. This is not something that we look at and we say, oh, that's great that God gave them that commandment. But no, God is really giving us that commandment. So Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And if you were here this morning, you remember that we, we discussed how Jesus is talking about the triumph of the cross. That now that he has overcome, now that he has been resurrected and raised from the dead, now he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. There is no name that is greater than his name. He has now the keys of death and hell. He has the authority. And now he is going to say something to them in verse number 19. And that is how we started this message. Go, therefore. In other words, what he's just saying is because I have all authority, number one, I'm commanding you to do something. To go there for. But he's also giving them his delegated authority in the commandment that he gives them. Because he is risen, because he is resurrected, because he is who he says he is, because he endured the cross, suffered the shame, went to the grave and overcame, now because of all that, I command you, go therefore. Look at what he says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So he says, I want you to go and I want you to do something. I want you to make disciples, baptize them. He's giving us a commission. He's giving us a commandment. This is something that is not optional. You remember this morning we talked about it, that this is a God assignment, that this is something that God wants for you and I to do each and every day of our lives is to go to our lives, our spheres of influence, our communities, our street, our family, our job, our school, wherever it is that we're going to go, that we're going to go there for. Why? Because Jesus is risen. Why? Because God is who he says he is. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ is worthy of all of my heart and all of my life. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ is worthy of my being obedient to what he has commanded me to do. He owns me now, and therefore my life is not my own, and if I'm on a God assignment, then this is not optional. I've got to do it because that's what I've been commanded to do. Go, therefore, make disciples. Now, once we know the authority of Christ that we go in, and now that we are operating in that authority, there are some things that we have to do in order for us to be successful at this commandment of God. 
Now, we could have taken a look at several things. We could have talked about the authority. We could have talked about how we can speak the name of Jesus. We, we could have talked about our covenant with God. We could have talked about many things tonight. I believe that God is selecting a couple of things that are appropriate to what we've been talking about with regard to the year of the shout. How we are to go. Tonight, a couple of things we're going to take a look at about how we are to go. Not just what we're supposed to do, but also how we're supposed to do it. If we're going to go and make disciples, there's going to have to be some things that we do in order to make those disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Tonight, how we are to go. Number one, we are to go preaching. Go preaching. You say, Pastor Dan, that sounds so simplistic. I mean, that goes without saying. Does it really? See, because if we were doing this, we wouldn't need to be saying this, right? Right? I know in my life, I need to be told, go and preach. I need to be told, hey, every time you go to the gas station, there's going to be people around you. Every time you go to that place over there where they have the gas attendant, it's the same dude every time. Go talk to him, child. See, this is a conversation the Lord and I have oftentimes. Sitting there, kicking back, doing my thing, right? And God says, go tell them about Jesus. And, and how many of you do this, like me, right? You say, say what? I'm sorry, could you come again? Now, maybe it's different with you, but with me, I often don't get a second voice that comes to me and tells me again. Oftentimes, God just tells me once, and that's enough. Why? Because he doesn't mix words. What he told me, I, I know. I know better. And so, therefore, yes, Lord, right? Sometimes reluctantly, sometimes, you know, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Sometimes all I can get out is, hey, man, Jesus loves you. That's all I get. Sometimes I get out of, do you go to church? Sometimes I, I can get out a lot more because I have more time. But see, God is telling us to not just go, but he's telling us to go preaching. God wants us to open our mouths. Like we heard this morning that, that we are to go everywhere preaching the gospel and if necessary, use words. I'm here to tell you tonight, it's necessary. It is. See, the reason why... They say, if necessary, use words. is because you're not going to have time or relationship with everyone you come in contact with to preach the gospel. Therefore, you have to live it. Okay? And people will see that. That's going to be the Bible that they read. But as you have opportunity, which we do, church, let's never use that saying as a cop-out to not open our mouth and preach the gospel. You see, the, the moment you start to get a hold of this and you start to realize God wants me to open my mouth, sometimes fear comes in, sometimes anxiety comes in, I'm not a public speaker, I can't do like Pastor Jim and Pastor Deb and Pastor Luke and Pastor, I can't do that. God is not calling you to do this, God is calling you to do this. There's a difference. And God will open doors of opportunity. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed and said, God, I, I want to minister to somebody today. Can you open up a door? And it's almost like here I am sitting down at, you know, Starbucks or something like that. And somebody plops down next to me and says, do you know about God? Can you, do you go to church? You know, and, and it's like, oh my goodness, Lord, that's an open door. Let me walk right through that. Why? Because I prayed for it. And now I recognize this is God opening the door. It's time for me to preach. You know, this, this great commission in Matthew if you look at the one in Mark, turn, turn to Mark chapter number 16. Let's take a look at it together. Mark chapter 16, the Great Commission looks a little different. There's a, a bit of different words, but still the same emphasis. Take a look at it, Mark chapter 16, verse number 15. And he, being Jesus, capital H, said to them, the disciples, and speaking to us today, look at what he says. Go. There's that word again. Go therefore. He said to them, Go, but not just go. Look at what he says. Go into all the world and do what? I'm glad that there's six of you that have your Bibles open. If you don't have your Bible, it's up on the overhead. Let's try that again. And he said to them, go into all the world and do what? Preach. Oh, come on. You got to say it like you're in the Southern Gospel Church. Come on now. Go into all the world and what? Preach. There it is. There it is. I knew I had to get a little southern on you guys for a second. Go into all the world and preach. Preach what? Preach the gospel to every creature. God wants us to open our mouth. If all you know is Jesus died for our sins. That's the gospel right there. If that's all you got right now, then give it. 
Give what you've got. If all you know is I went to church and my life is changed, that is enough to change someone else's life. God never said we had to have a degree or never said that we had to understand the whole Bible. Listen, there are people in this room who have been studying the Bible for decades that will tell you, I still don't understand stuff, myself being included in that number. But God just wants us to go and to preach, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. It's good news that God will change your life. It's good news that church has a help and a healing and a restoration. It's good news that Jesus died so that we didn't have to. It's good news. Good news that we don't have to go to hell. It's good news that the punishment that was meant for us, the wrath of God, was poured out on the cross, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news. And that's what we are to preach. Drop down to verse number 20, Mark 16, 20. And they... The disciples went out, they goad, so to speak, and what did they do? Preached. Preached everywhere. My goodness, these guys went all over the place, all over the world. And they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. My goodness, without preaching, there's nobody getting saved. Let me say that again. Without preaching preaching there is nobody getting saved why because that's the plan of God you preach they believe they get saved that's how God intended it to be God doesn't just download it it's not like osmosis you know you can't lay your Bible under your pillow at night and wake up saved that's not how this works somebody has to preach the word of God in order for somebody to get saved it's the plan of God Okay, I'll convince you. Romans chapter 10. Let's take a look at it together. Romans chapter 10. We know that in Romans chapter 10, it talks about salvation. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So how does that happen? Well, Romans chapter 10. Take a look at verse 13. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For whoever, everybody say whoever. Whoever "Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? See, they can't call on somebody if they don't believe in him. It doesn't work. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? They've got to hear. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Verse number 15, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now in there I see a process. If you take the words of these verses and you take the main emphasis and you wrote them backwards, you would get the process. Let me share it with you. Sent. Preach, hear, believe, call, saved. We have that up on the overhead? There it is. Let's read it again real quick. Leave those words up on the overhead. I'm just going to read it to them. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? There's the word call. And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? There's belief. And there's heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Preach. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? See, Jesus Christ knew what he was doing. He already knew the plan of God for people to get saved. And it wasn't just through God downloading it or osmosis or anything like that or just a revelation, wow, okay, I need to get saved. No, there had to be disciples that were sent into the world. There had to be a church that had a commission to be sent into the world. You and I are sent to do what? To preach. Preach, preach, preach what? The gospel. Preach what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Preach what? The the repentance from dead works. We're sent to preach so that people can hear. If you read there in Romans chapter 10, you'll, you'll read that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Well, faith, that's believing. 
So we're sent to preach so that people can hear and believe. And when they believe, they will do what? They will call on the name of the Lord. And everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. See, it's a process. And God knew it. Sent, preach, hear, believe, call, save. Jesus is saying, go therefore into all the world. You are sent to preach the gospel so that people can hear and believe and call in the name of the Lord and be saved. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. How we are to go, number one, is we are to go preaching. Second thing for tonight, we are to go in a certain way. Jesus Christ has sent us in his authority. Jesus Christ has given us the authority now. And we are to go, therefore, in his authority. We are to go preaching. We have the message. We have the good news. Second thing, we are to go boldly. Not timidly. Not tiptoe around the place. No, we are to go boldly. If you have ever gone into a dark room and turned on the light, what happens? The room changes, right? Now all of a sudden you can see everything. Take that same dark room and just turn on a flashlight. The only thing you're going to see is what that flashlight is pointing out. Take that same room and just light a little teeny tiny match. What happens? The match is now the center of attention. Right? It doesn't matter how great or how little the light is. It's still light and it's still going to have the same effect. Jesus Christ, when he sends you into the world, he says you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. You are a Christian. You can't go any other way than boldly. You getting what I'm saying? Jesus Christ has made you light. When you go out there into the darkness and you shine your light, that's a bold statement. Whether it's a match or whether it is a giant floodlight on the roof, it's light and it's going to change things. See, sometimes people see themselves, well, I'm just a little teeny tiny little insignificant thing. What could I do? Oh, well, shine your light. You are to go boldly out there into the world, not timidly. Too often we don't want to offend anyone. Oh, I, I don't want to, you know, scare anyone away from Jesus Christ. And that sounds great, but listen, it's time to start rattling some cages because I would rather offend them and save their soul than pitter-patter around them and patty cake with them and they go to hell. That's how serious this thing is. And when I understand that people have an eternal destiny that's at stake, all of a sudden i got to speak boldly. I've got to get outside of myself and start getting into Jesus Christ and into his commission and into his authority and go, therefore, and preach the word of God with boldness. Many times we don't want to look foolish. Well, if I start to tell people about Jesus, they'll think I'm crazy. They believe in evolution. They believe in no God. They, they believe in reason. They, they're more educated than me. I'm going to look stupid. Yes, you are, but that's okay. Because it's better to be a fool for Jesus Christ than it is to say nothing and be chastened by the Lord. See, God knows what he's doing. In fact, the Bible contains scriptures about the foolishness of preaching. Let's take a look at it together. Turn there with me. The nature of the gospel is that it will offend. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Just by the very nature of the gospel is that it's going to offend. Jesus Christ is called the chief cornerstone. And the Bible tells us that he was laid in Zion and called the rock of offense. My goodness. Paul wrote to the Galatians of the offense of the cross. See, this thing by nature is offensive. You're going to offend people and you're going to look foolish. doesn't matter how you look in their eyes. What matters is, are you walking in obedience to what God has called you to do? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and verse 24. Look at what it says. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the, Je to the Greeks foolishness. Look at verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. See, it's going to offend people. When you take your Bible to work and you sit down in the break room and you've got your sandwich out, you've got your apple slices, you've got your milk, and you open up your Bible and you sit there and you read it, there's going to be people that get offended. What are you doing with that? Hey, I'm going to talk to the boss. People shouldn't be bringing their stuff in here, jamming it down people's throats. And all you were doing was reading. They're going to be offended when they see a little card that says, Hey, check out what my church is doing. 
I want to invite you to church. And they're going to get offended. They're going to throw them down on the ground. They're going to throw them in the trash. They're going to warn other people, don't go by that person. They're crazy. They're going to try and hand you a card that invites you to church. The nature of this thing is offensive. You go on to the college campus, and the people arguing about whether it's creative reason or, or, or intelligent design versus evolution versus whatever else, they're going to be offended when you say, hey, there's something going on in my church. I'd like to invite you to it. They're going to put their nose up at you, think that they're better than you. Think that they know more than you. How could you believe that foolishness? That's fairy tales. That's children's stories. How could you believe that? See, the nature of this thing is offensive. People are going to be offended. People are going to look at you like you're a fool. Now, I'm so glad that God kept in Scripture for us people to look at, people to see. Their everyday life, those people that went before us, think about them. All the great men and women of faith that we see in the Bible. One of them, think about this man for a second. Think about the Apostle Paul. Here's the Apostle Paul. He has a miraculous conversion, meets up with Jesus on the road, gets knocked off his horse. Bam! He's blinded by the light. He hears the voice. He's groping around. He's led to a place. The gospel's preached to him. He's baptized. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now all of a sudden he stands up and starts to preach. Gets everybody so riled up that they have to lower him down out a window in a basket to save his life. Oh my goodness. I mean, this guy is bold. Think about the Apostle Paul for a second. Goes out into the desert, gets caught up in all these revelations. Man, this guy has is, is just got so many things from God. He's preaching the gospel because Jesus has taught him by revelation. Oh my goodness, now he's sent to the Gentiles. He's, he's out there planting churches separated to do the work of the ministry. This guy has miracles, signs and wonders being done. I mean, people are getting so mad in cities that riots are ensuing. They're dragging the leaders of the synagogue and beating them up in front of the leaders of their nation. This guy, you would think, is bold, he's blunt, he's sometimes maybe rude, he is offensive. Now remember, we're talking about we go boldly. We would think the Apostle Paul has no problem with this. I mean, this guy has the gusto, right? He's got guts. He's, he, he's got what it takes. I could never do that. I, 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 I couldn't be that bold. I, I couldn't rattle cages like that and ruffle feathers like that. That's just for the apostles. That's just for him. I mean, he had special revelation. My question is, if he had all that, then why in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 19 and 20, does he ask for prayer? Take a look at it with me. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians. I want you to see this in your Bible. Anytime you feel like you're unworthy, anytime you feel like you can't do it, anytime you feel like you're not bold enough, just remember that you're in good company. Because there's a man by the name of the Apostle Paul who asked people to pray for him. Look at Ephesians 6, 19 and 20. Look at what he asked them to pray for. Okay, he starts talking about praying with all prayers, supplication, and spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, verse 19, and for me. What did he say? Pray for me, please. Pray for me. What's he want prayer for? Paul, what do you want prayer for? You're the apostle, Paul. You started this church. Right? He's writing to the Ephesians. Paul, you started this church. Miracles, signs, and wonders, how could we pray for you? Pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Wow, okay, well that sounds pretty cool. That utterance may be given, oh he's asking for preaching, right? But look at verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What is he saying? Two times in two verses, he repeats his prayer request. And at the end of it all, he says, as I ought to speak. That means that for you and I, we know how we ought to speak and we know how we often speak. 
me say that again. We know how we ought to speak, but we know how we often speak. And I believe the Apostle Paul was asking for prayers. Here he is in chains. And he says, pray that utterance may be given to me, that I may speak boldly, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly. He had it on his mind as I ought to speak. If the Apostle Paul is asking for prayer for this, guys, you and I are in great company. Because if God can use this man, the Apostle Paul, a little ball-headed Jewish guy, who was very tender and mild in person, but in his letters they said, oh, he's bold just in his letters. If he's asking for boldness, then you and I are in great company. What can God do with a church here in San Bernardino that's radical, fanatical for Jesus Christ, giving a shout for who he is? We need to pray and we need to receive that boldness and speak as we ought to speak. Amen. How we are to go. Number one, we're to go preaching. Number two, we are to go boldly. Number three, we're to go unafraid and unhindered. Go unafraid and go unhindered. We learned this morning not only that it, are we on a God assignment, but it's a faith assignment. Oftentimes, the biggest hindrance to our faith is our fears. The biggest hindrance to our own faith is our own fears. We don't want to step out. We don't want to ask people, can I pray for you? Why? Because we're afraid that our prayers won't get answered. We don't want to preach to somebody. Why? Because we're afraid they're going to reject us. We don't want to bring our Bible because we're afraid that it's going to stir up controversy or maybe I'll lose my job. And in this market, that's a bad thing. I've got to hold what I've got. Oftentimes, our fears are the biggest hindrance to our faith. But if we can remember that God is with us, then we have nothing to fear. If you remember that it's God's responsibility to heal, then all you're doing is praying and letting God channel through you. And whether they're healed or not healed, that's not your call. That's his call. You guys got to get a hold of this tonight. See, if we preach the gospel, if we open our mouth and we tell someone about Jesus and they reject the message, they haven't rejected us, they've rejected him, Jesus says. They don't reject you, they reject me. See, if we get a clue that God is with us, then fear goes away. Why? Because what do you need? What provision do you have need of? What resource do you have need of? Do you need boldness? Do you need finances? Do you need clarity of mind? Do you need speech? Do you need the words to say? See, God has all of that under control. And when you realize that God is with you in this, that's that point number three from this morning, that, that grace empowers us to give the shout. See, Jesus doesn't say, go therefore and do it all on your own. Hopefully you make it. No, he says, go therefore in my authority, preach the gospels, and then they went out and preached the Lord working with them, giving the accompanying signs. Wow. What does that mean? Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. See, he didn't send them out. He says, I don't send you as orphans. If I go, I'll send the promised Holy Spirit to you. So we know that wherever we go, God is with me. What can man do to me? That's why Joshua Before he went into the promised land, God was speaking to him and he said, Joshua, be strong. Be strong and of good courage. No one will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. You're going to be unhindered, Joshua. And he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. For I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a word for some of you in this room tonight. You feel like God has abandoned you, like God has lifted his hand off of you. You feel like you've messed up too much, been too dirty. Walk too far away. But God is telling you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, now, remember, you can have as much of God as you want to. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. There is a responsibility on your part. But God has not utterly rejected you. 
why he will never leave you nor forsake you. And the moment you get back into God and you draw near to God, there's the promise, I I will draw near to you, God says. So when you decide, I'm going to go to my family who knows I'm a screw up, and I'm going to start to preach the gospel, then we know that God is with us because we're walking in obedience and we're walking in faith. Yeah, they might laugh at you. They might reject you. They might say, well, hey, we know what you were doing Saturday night. Now you're going to tell us about church on Sunday morning? Listen, you just do what God has called you to do. Walk in holy living. Change. Do what you got to do. Suffer the rejection and the scorn. Why? Because now you're sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And eventually, watch God turn it around. Eventually, when they're having a problem, they're going to say, you know what, I'm going to go to that crazy Christian for prayer. I'm going to go to them for counsel. I'm going to go to them because their life seems to be together. I need to get my life together. Go unafraid and go unhindered. Great verse in the book of Acts. Turn there with me to Acts chapter number 18. Looking at the life of Paul again. Acts chapter number 18. Looking at verse number 9. In verse number 10, the Apostle Paul is ministering in Corinth. Look at the words of Jesus. Acts chapter 18, verse number 9 says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid. Everybody say, do not be afraid. afraid. Tell yourself, "Do do not be afraid. Oh, come on, get rough with yourself. Do not be afraid. See, we've got to shake ourselves sometimes and tell ourselves these things. You've got to talk to yourself. Why? Because the natural tendency is, I'm afraid. I can't do it. Uh, I'll be rejected. But you've got to roust yourself and remind yourself of the words of Jesus Christ. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Look at what Jesus is speaking. Preach, Paul. Go, therefore, and preach. Make disciples. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent. Why? Verse number 10, for I am with you. Anytime you feel fear coming on, you say, no, the Lord is with me. No, God is on my side. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? So you've got to remind yourself of these things. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I don't care what fear, what trial, what hindrance, what stumbling block, what, what, what divot in the road. It doesn't matter why because he's with me. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. Look at what he says. For I have many people in this city. God lets us know that not only is he with us. But he's got people with us too. Man, Christians will come out of the woodwork. Will raise up. You know, Elijah, when he was crying before the Lord and saying, God, everybody's dead and now they seek my life too. There's no one who serves you, Lord. All the bow their knees to bell. What did God tell him? He says, no, 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 no. I have reserved for myself a remnant that have not bowed their knee to bell. You're not alone. I'm with you. But I've got many people. Guys, if we're going to reach our city, if we're going to reach this inland empire, we need to realize that God has given us a commandment. This is the year of the shout. This is a year to go. This is a year to go in his authority and to do something, to preach. We are to go preaching. Why? Because if we don't preach, no one gets saved. Because how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe if they do not hear? And how shall they hear unless there's a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? It's a process that you and I are a part of. And God has commanded each and every one of us to go. We are to go preaching, number one. Number two, we are to go boldly. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid. Don't whisper it. This is a year of a shout, not the year of the whisper. Last year was the year of staying silent and not moving and keeping our eyes focused on God. But this year, God has commanded us to go and to go boldly, to give a shout. And number three, go unafraid and unhindered. Tonight, if you got something from the word of the Lord, let's give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to some of you guys before you head out. I'll let you go in a second. Just stay put for a sec. Listen up. Because God wants to speak to you. God doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. We can find that in the Bible. The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish. It's not the will of God, but it's something that he's given us a free will choice. We choose. 
Sometimes people don't know how that happens. They don't know how to get to heaven. They don't know how to get to hell. Sometimes people would say things like, well, all roads lead to heaven. I've heard that a lot in our day. Many people think that whatever you do is fine because I'll do it my way, you do it your way, we'll all get there the same way. But listen, that, that doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. The specific way you have to get there. And don't you think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who panned the, panned the plan of redemption, carried it out in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, don't you think that if he went to the cross and suffered, was beaten, bloody, nailed to a cross, my goodness, don't you think that he would tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does in his word. He doesn't leave it up to you or me or some well-meaning church committee. This is about what God says. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. Therefore, it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news because I know that God's way of getting to heaven is by being good. And you know what? I, I used to be bad, but I, I've been really good lately and, and really been working on my resume before going to be in heaven and, and, and been doing a lot of good things. And therefore, I'm a Christian and I'm going to go to heaven because I've been really good. Helped people out, gave money to charities, been nice to my neighbors, and, and I'm a good person, therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible where you are good, that you get to go to heaven? See, it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible does it say how good we have to be in order to get to heaven, like there's some grading scale or a curve that you have to be above. And if you're good enough, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that because the standard is perfection. And the only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. And you're not going to get there just by being good. And I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. I honor and respect you enough to not play games. Come on, listen up, let's talk. Sometimes people think, well, I was raised in church. And my parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians, hung a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck, had me baptized or maybe christened as a child. Took you to religious classes like Sabbath school or Sunday school or catechism class. And you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. But the problem with that thinking is, could you show me in the Bible where it says that you were raised in church parents take you to church and call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's not there. And nowhere in the Bible does it say you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that says America is the Christian nation, or that if you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, and denying hell. It simply doesn't work like that. Some of you would say, well, okay, pastor, I understand that, but not only when I was child did I go to church, but here I'm sitting in church right now. I, I'm sitting in front of you all night tonight, therefore I'm a Christian. Really, could you show that to me in the Bible? Where it says you sit in church service and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It simply doesn't work. Think about it this way. Would you be able to just put on a Dodger uniform, drive to Los Angeles, sit in the dugout of Dodger Stadium, bring your bat and your ball and get to play in the game? No, why? Because you're not a Dodger. They'll find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. You can't just sit in a place, call yourself something, and that makes you something. That'd be like sitting in your garage, calling yourself a car. It doesn't work. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. If that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, okay, yeah, I got that. But not only have I attended church, I've, I've been involved in church. My last church, I sang in the choir for a number of years. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I've been taught in the Bible classes and, and I got a membership card. It's wonderful. I'm glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible where it says that you help out in church, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You teach in the Bible classes and you get a membership card to that church that God is looking for your membership card when you enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your church involvement is what gets you into heaven. Come on, let's not play games tonight. Let's talk. Some of you would say, well, okay, I got you on this one, Pastor. Somebody told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I, I know God. I, I, I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrated every year of my life. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you out of the Old and New Testament, tell you stories from the Bible. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you can do those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? 
where you know God. Listen, everybody knows who God is. Everybody in America knows about Jesus, the baby in the manger. Everybody knows about Easter. But listen, not everybody is going to heaven just because they know something. In fact, if you've read your Bible, you'll find out that the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That doesn't make them Christians because they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, knows who he is. The Bible says the devil quotes scriptures. Wow. But he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So what's going on here? Look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who he is, or being able to quote some scriptures, but rather this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Jesus said it like this. He said to a man by the name of Nicodemus, who was a religious leader of his day, good guy, did good things, raised up in his church. He attended there. He got involved there. Eventually became one of the leaders. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He gave his money. We would have thought this guy was headed for heaven. And yet Jesus doesn't pat him on the back, say, good job, man. Keep doing what you're doing. What does Jesus say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. This is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, here's what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't done that, then tonight I love you enough, respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. But I don't want to leave you there. Tonight I want to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Wow. So in a moment, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Get over it. Here's why. Because think of the trade-off for a second. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. You would raise anything you could to get out of hell if you landed there. Man, you'd run your underwear up a flagpole just to get out. But there are no exits in hell, and this is a very serious thing. So I want to make sure that you have this opportunity now, tonight. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So come on. You can do that in a safe and friendly place. Jesus said, if you confess me before man, I'm a man, I'll see your hand go up. He says, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Wow. But he also says, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God loves you so much, he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a tree. He died so that you and I could be forgiven of everything we've ever done wrong. But he was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Tonight, will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight you can make sure. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? What does that mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out. A little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's the condition of your heart that I just described, you need to get right with God. You say, well, wait, why, why, why? Well, here's the reason why. Because Jesus was speaking to a church in the book of Revelation, and he said, I'm coming soon. And when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit from my mouth. Wow. Graphic words from the mouth of Jesus. But what is he really saying? He's saying that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. Otherwise, why would they be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ? Tonight, will you give them all of your heart? Will you give them all of your life? If you're in any of those four categories that I just mentioned, Running from God instead of to God, never done this, not sure or lukewarm. Come on, 
Get ready. You can raise your hand in the safe and friendly place when I clap my hands in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by foyer in the television, by television in the foyer, that's better, or at the Love Rock Cafe, come on, you can get right with God right where you're at. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six, seven. Thank you. Eight, nine. Up in the family room. I got you. Nine wise people. Ten. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? Ten wise people already. I got you guys. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you guys. About ten wise people. Where are you at number 11? You're sitting there wondering if you should. Come on. Yeah, you should. Come on. Let's go for God tonight. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. Anybody else? Thank you. Number 11. Where are you at? Number 12. Come on. Just want to give you an opportunity. Thank you. Number 12. Number 13. Come on. Anybody else real quick? You know you need to give them all of your heart. Listen, they've already raised their hands. How about anybody over here? You know you need to give God all your heart and all your life. Come on. Stop waiting. Today is the day of salvation. Anybody else, real quick. Need to give God all your heart and all your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> my goodness, my goodness. All 12 of you. Or if you're number 13, number 14, number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. It's not too late. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. In a moment, we're all going to stand and sing a song as we do. If you raised your hand or you should have, I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front. Why? Because we're going to change destinies tonight. But we can't do that until we get you down here. So if you raised your hand or you should have, just let's all stand and welcome them as they come. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. You come right now. Just come on. Cause Lord, I give you my heart. I give you They're my They're coming. Let's give my hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. You alone, every breath that I take, every for the family rooms, you can bring your kids. Come on down. Come on. Just make your way to the front right now. Lord, have your Somebody else, if you need to come, just make your way down. You can come too. They're still coming. Come on, let's give them a hand. Come on, we'll wait for you. Just make your way to the front right now. You come. You come. All right, everybody. Thank God you guys have come. I'm so excited for you. Put a smile on your face. It's a good thing. This is not a bad thing, all right? In a moment, you're going to pray a prayer to receive Jesus. You're going to be born again. Remember, we talked about this. You, you heard the gospel, and now you're going to call on the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on, okay? He's going to do a couple things with you. Number one, he's going to pray a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. That's calling on the name of the Lord. You will be saved. You're going to be born again. All right? Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff. A couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. And then finally, he's going to give you what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of God. And so I encourage you, it's free. Now listen, you said, you said you're going to give God all your heart. And you said you're going to give God all of your life. I didn't say it. You said it. Now, a spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you to do what you just said you were going to do. They're going to help you to get strong in the ways of God and to serve Him with all of your heart and all of your life for the rest of your days. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.